store that's been upgraded, it's got a format. You have to start doing things like, you know, health checking and things of that nature. And they invented this pattern called the operator, and it's a pattern, it's not actually a specific library of software. And it, it has these operations that you do, and it tries to encapsulate all the dirty little secrets that we're all aware of how software gets upgraded into a piece of software that sits underneath your declaration. And you, now you say, hey operator, the new desired state is to be running version five, I don't know what you got running. And it says, hey, look at that, I'm currently on version four, that means I need to do the following. And the operator needs to do a little backwards because you know, sometimes version five wasn't the right one. Um, and it turns out that there's been this big argument in the, in the Kubernetes community about whether databases should run there. So some people like myself think that that's okay. They invented stateful sets for a reason. We can run databases. Other people are like, no, that's one of those things that that's somebody else's problem. You manage it externally. So you're, you're probably doing it for a database, right? Or something like that? Uh, actually, well, partially. Um, we have, um, Services which depend on other stateful services, including databases, some of which, uh, if you do not give them a uh, password at the call time, will create a valid password every single time. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorites is the password management. There's two strategies for password management. There's the one that everybody employs and the one that everybody should employ. The one that everybody employs is some random environment variable that gets vomited into standard out and in every log and is meant to be perfectly secure. Hey, come on up front. There's some pizza and beer up here, man. Hi. Um, and then there's the vault, right? So everybody talks about having a vault that's got some, uh, some store that you open and it gets your certificate, your password, your PKI. Now, that's one of the things I haven't figured out yet. Is anyone doing that one? All right. Yeah, I, I read, Which, both, read both in production. So HashiCorp? Both? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it worked for you? Very well. Yeah. Although you'll run into a lot of issues. Uh, previously, like using something like console for high availability as a backend store, it was not very stable at the time. Yeah. Um, it's another thing that you might not want to run in your Kubernetes cluster, but they've later fixed that, so it's, it's possible to run that there too. Are you talking about console for backend or? No, just console, the only console container. Yeah. So, Kyle and I are in the middle of sort of planning out our continuous deployment strategy. And we're probably, well, middle is a strong term, so we're maybe a little earlier than you, and we're maybe further along than some. But um, I don't have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I, I talk about some of the challenges that we've been facing uh, conceptually. So, obviously, if everybody's talking about continuous, and probably everybody in the room has some aspect of continuous integration running now, whether it be entirely automatic or partially automatic, you know, we all recognize the benefit that comes from, I check it in and I do some testing on it. It might be a simple unit test or smoke test, it might be the full jam, but obviously that means that problems get found earlier, you get more check-ins per day, you don't have to worry as much. Um, the corollary to that is if you upgrade often, you get good at it. So about three years ago, I had this aha moment. I was, I was sitting in a customer meeting, and uh, it was a big customer, it was a telco in the US. You know, they had millions of subscribers, and they were running an OpenStack system for production that they used for some reasonably mission critical stuff. Um, and uh, they, they posed this question to the audience, how often do you think we upgrade our OpenStack? And I'm like, well, every February 29th is the most likely answer to this. They're going to get that stable. They're going to lock the door and fire all the people that know how to get in and leave it alone, right? And the guy's like, we upgrade it every Friday. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we upgrade this every Friday. And people are like, first of all, they can't process the once a week, and they can't process the Friday. And he said, no, we, we, we had this problem in the past. We had a lot of software that we only upgraded when there was an emergency every 18 months. And it became this huge problem because nobody knew how to upgrade it, but suddenly it has to be done tomorrow, and everything would always go badly. So we said, you know, we got to get good at is upgrade. So what we do is all the check-ins that start at any time, once they've all been committed to this branch, if they pass all the tests, then they get all merged to this other branch. And Friday morning, whatever is on that branch is passed. Friday night, that gets deployed. It happens all automatically. Now, I'm sure he was making some of this up because, you know, there's some problems, but 
that's going to be my strategy as well. If you upgrade often, not only are you good at it, it means when there's an emergency, you can do it in a hurry, but also it means you've actually automated it to the point where it doesn't cost you anything. And that's, I think that's kind of their nirvana. Um, and that allows you to have more value delivered more continuously to your customers. So instead of it being that, oh my god, they're going to upgrade once a year and you know, it's going to be a big deal, you can upgrade every week, which means that there's more value more constantly. Um, the other thing is, there's this other concept people, you know, you've all heard the term infrastructure as code. The concept is that you, you, you check in a file that says how your infrastructure should work. Usually YAML, but it could be something else. And it effectively says, I have three of these, talking to two of these, using these IPs on this interface, or whatever level it's at. And what that means is if there's any drift, and, and by drift, they really mean people that are trying to do the right thing, that are doing the wrong thing. So somebody's logged in a patch to something. You know, oh, this isn't working the right way, let me just do a quick patch. The problem is those always break your upgrades, because you never test it against what that guy did on his patch. So what the infrastructure code allows you to do is to continuously audit so your continuous deployment might deploy every Friday, but your continuous deployment might check that it's in the desired state every millisecond. And that means that you get, a minimum, you get an alarm saying, hey, something's not in the desired state, but more likely it pushes it back to the desired state. Going back to that declarative versus imperative. This is another bit of an aha moment for me is, you know, what does that mean? So for our infrastructure, it, it, we, Kyle and I were originally thinking Helm. You know, I'm a big fan. Does everybody know what Helm is? So Helm is like, a, it's like a YAML-based system with templates that you, you define what you want. It runs through the templating engine, so you can have simple substitutions and loop on all in, and then it deploys that. The idea of Helm is that it's easier to maintain, but the reality of Helm is there's an awful lot of curly brackets involved, and the human mind can't process that number of curly brackets. So they're talking about embedding Lua in it, which I think is actually where it jumps off the cliff, and there's a shark behind them somewhere. But that's what they're going to do, is they're going to make it Lua-based somehow. Um, so the challenges that we, that we see is, the biggest one is state. So you've always got something that's stateful. You've got a database that's recording audit logs. Uh, you've got, you know, state that can be rebuilt. Um, so state that can be rebuilt would be an example, would be SSL session keys, something like that. Uh, you might have, the customer might have logged into a web interface and they've got cookies. Those cookies are stored in some Redis database, that can be, can be rebuilt, but there's a bit of a cost to it. State can be at the level of TCP connections. Some people might be unhappy with their TCP connection breaking. Others, it's different strategies. But the reality is, this is, this is where things go wrong in the, in the continuous deployment, is you've got something that's stateful, and you're gonna have an automated process that's gonna move from state A to B, and if you haven't defined all those state transitions and tested all of them, then you're gonna get referential integrity issues in your database. And for some of us in the past, working on a large database, that was the biggest problem is every time you do an upgrade, the SQL upgrade would fail halfway through saying index nine refers to field J, which is not in table W. And you know, you, how did that happen? Did somebody patch it over the years? Did a previous upgrade fail? Who knows? But right now you're sitting there with a busted database and you didn't do the entire upgrade in a transaction because it would be too costly. So you can't actually hit abort and you're kind of stuck. So that, that, the solution to that problem is always a person, it's a person. You say, hey, person's name, come over here. So the challenges are, if you can't avoid state entirely, where do you move it to? You know, so the simple answer is you move it outside your domain, you make it somebody else's problem. Yeah, 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 we just use Amazon S3 and Azure Block Storage and GCS and everything's a flat file and we never upgrade them, so we're good, right? But then the problem is, you know, oh my god, I'm running a database. Well, let's run database service. We're on Big Table or Spanner or Cosmo or something. Ah, now we're done there, right? Redis, oh shit, Redis, uh, customer store. Uh, okay, so let me do that. Uh, we'll make users re-log in and upgrade. It's reasonable. They don't, they don't have to log in too often. We'll do this too often. Okay, maybe. Or maybe, hey, Redis has a service. Somebody has one of those that just hot upgrades. Who knows? But eventually you get to something that just can't be fixed. Um, and one of the stories that I saw recently, there's a bank in the UK so nobody likes to talk about what went wrong, right? So they talk to their friends about, oh my God, last night, you wouldn't believe what happened. Everything went to hell manifested. But get that guy on a stage and he's like, unlike the rest of you guys, my company has never had an outage, you know? So it's really interesting. His background bank, he stands up and he says, here's how it all went wrong and here's how we fixed it. And what had happened to them was actually continuous deployment had blown them up, but not the way they did think. So what happened is on one day, there was one team and they're deploying something new and it's not, it's not going to be enabled in production. 
but they use one deployment so that they can use blue-green testing so their ingress controller can route traffic to them. So nobody's going to see it but them. And they deploy this thing, and they're like, ah, shit, this thing doesn't work so good, right? So what are we going to do? We'll just set the number of replicas to zero, effectively disabling it. So all the code is still there, but there's none running. We're going to go away and debug our problem for a bit. Okay, no problem. So nothing bad happens. A couple days later, it's time for the continuous deployment of the real production system. And one of the things they upgrade is called Linkerd. And Linkerd is it's a type of uh, router for traffic. So it, it routes, it's their ingress controller, it routes HTTP traffic by URL. And unbeknownst to them, so Linkerd is written in Go. And uh, they install this, and the first thing Go does is just panics. Blah, big stack tricks. So they're like, crap. Well, at least they've got 15 Linkerd's running. And then they notice that they're all going, blah. So as fast as they can core dump, they're coming back up, and there's a little bit of their traffic still flowing, but they're core dumping like mad. So they start, they do what everyone here would do, is they look through the stack trace and try to figure it out. They first hit the undo button, so they roll back. It keeps crashing. They're like, uh-oh. Yeah, we just hit undo, control Z, and control Z didn't fix it. We tried everything, we're all out of ideas. So they have to look at the stack trace. And it turns out that what's happened is, in Go, they, they've made a change, that nobody really thought about, because these guys didn't know, is in YAML, or actually JSON, uh, it used to be that an empty array could be specified as either null or bracket bracket. These are the same thing, right? You've got x colon null and x colon square bracket square bracket. They're both an empty array, right? So it turns out that they fixed that ambiguity. And Linkerd being written in Go and using the Go parser for YAML, it just falls on its ass. And so this is one of the problems is you have to be able to downgrade, but sometimes there's something that you upgrade that is undowngradable. In this case, what had happened was that was stored in the Redis, and the new version had come up and it fixed this problem. And when they hit the downgrade, you know, they, they, they couldn't go back. Um, the secrets, the other the big secret, the quick challenge we're looking at right now is the secret store. So, you know, we're using Kubernetes. Kubernetes has this uh, thing called a secret and a thing called a config map. I can tell you one thing that's not secret about Kubernetes is its secrets. The encryption algorithm is base 64. So you take the secret, which anybody can read, and you echo it to base64-d, and now you can see the raw value. Not very secret, in my opinion. You can do a little bit of role-based access control to make it less likely that people see the secret. And you can tell your developers that you should never echo your secrets to standard out when the container starts, because the logs, they go to Elasticsearch, and everybody and their dog can see that. The reality is probably that doesn't really work. Because there's no way to scrape the logs, pipe to grep password, unless your developers are using password as a password, which does happen. Uh, so the secret store, there are tools. So we mentioned one, HashiCorp Vault is probably the best known product out there. Uh, there are ones associated with the big cloud providers as well. And these allow you to have um, role-based IAM control to go and fetch something. But now you've got this challenge. You either need to retool your application. So instead of it just being a Node.js app that does get in Redis password, apply it, you've actually got to go change the code to say, open the secret store, pass the RBAC all the way through, get the ephemeral thing, use it, delete it from memory, scrub the memory. Um, there's a project that I looked at, remember that project was called Kyle that we looked at that she, she tried to come up with a way to do this automatically and I suggested my LD preload hack, which normally gets me thrown out, but um, anyway, they tried to, it's tried a little proxy server to try to do it automatically for you, uh, so they kind of hooked Hooked, uh, it's like Soxify, it hooked the URL open things to the various libraries. It seemed kind of crazy. Um, the other big challenge is the normalization of multi environment. Now, different people have different opinions. Dan, should you use more than one cloud provider? No. Why not? All right. So, Dan, Dan's opinion is a strong one. There's lots of people that say put all your eggs in one basket, go cloud lock in, and maximize the value there, minimize the team training time. So, it's a, it's a valid strategy. There's other people that say, you know, absolutely, I've got to be cloud neutral because reason A, I, I need to work in geographies that cloud provider isn't. Reason B, I'm worried about cost. Reason C is someday I'll buy a company, they'll be in a different cloud, I'm going to have to deal with it anyway. There's a bunch of reasons. Um, but the problem is, for a lot of people, they have to normalize multi environments. Even in the one cloud, you may find that you have to. So you've got a dev and a prod environment, or an east and a west, and it's hard to really work those out. So continuous deployment, we've been struggling with this. And then the hardship, so you've all heard of blue-green testing ideas, you bring some of the new stuff online, you keep most of the users locked on the old, some are on the new, maybe those new users work for you. If they say it's all good, then you put more of the new online and less of the old. Um, it sounds like a really good strategy, 
the enemy of the strategy as soon as that builds steam. Like imagine this is a banking app and I put a few of the new ones on and Mike's taking a transaction, he's, he's deposited some money as an account. I'm like, ah oh, shit, that didn't work. Let me just roll that back. Where Mike's money go? Right? So, you know, again, state is your enemy. So the tools that we've been looking at, um, so I'm looking at one called Spinnaker. Anyone heard of Spinnaker? All right. You think it's good, bad, or ugly? It's really complicated for so what it does, right? It uses a boat load of RAM for what it does. I, I tried using it. It's, it's way too complex. Surprisingly non-cloud native for something that's meant to be cloud native as well. Like, you can figure it through a CLI. It's got this huge Java supervisor that doesn't do anything other than, as far as I can tell, call pop on the main thing. I scrapped it pretty quick. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know. And you? Oh, okay. What, what did you replace it with? Terraform? No. GitLab? We, Come and GitLab. GitLab. So we, uh, we split our CIDC. We tried splitting our CICD into two different tools um, because we wanted to like release management stuff with yeah. our CD tool. We ended up just sticking with the CI tool and the deployment of the CI tool. So that was done with Circle CI. Okay. Um, it's a common pattern I've seen where, I mean, Netflix does this, where they, they still use Jenkins for CI, but then they use Spinnaker for CD. So I've seen that, but I, I've just found Spinnaker not to be reliable. So, we're, so the two choices for me, we're using GitLab, and GitLab has a ton of integration with Kubernetes and CD now. Um, but when you scratch the surface of that, a lot of it is pretty simple. Um, and we may end up the same way that you just said, so we may end up to use GitLab CI. One of the things that's really worked well for me is we use GitLab as our JWT signer. So all of our things, the trust comes through there, which makes it really simple. All the jobs in the CI have the permission to act on the container. On behalf of that user, they have the permission to act on the right other set of repos without being all of them. We don't have to create service accounts and so on. It's really worked well. Um, I've hooked Spinnaker up back to GitLab CI because it has that capability set, so it can still use it as a JWT signer. The promise of Spinnaker is that it can do better health checking on your deployment and better um, uh, like shift, like you know, look for things that have happened after the fact. Yeah, totally. Where where the GitLab one, it kind of runs once and it's kind of done. And if you're using Kubernetes, it hopes Kubernetes keeps it all the same. But if you're using things that aren't, it doesn't really reconcile them. Um, nobody else has any other opinions? Not yet. So I mean, that's one of my challenges, is we're currently investigating Spinnaker. Uh, I had a demo that was all set to go, but it might not be ready to go. We'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, and then the other thing I see a lot of people doing is um, sort of Ansible, Salt, Chef, Puppet, Foreman, those type of tools. Anyone using those? Love it, hate it, it works. It's kind of messed up. What's that? It's kind of messed. It does things. Yeah, it's not broke. Why would I fix it? You know, Ansible lets you do anything. So whenever there's something complicated, you know you can get it done in there. It's not really infrastructure as code, but you can trick yourself into thinking that because the scripts were checked in. So it kind of reconciles stuff, right? Yeah, there's no state tracking in Ansible, so. That kind of is. Yeah, so Ans Ansible does have a, I think I put it in this state, and it's in this state, therefore I need to change it. Right. But it's pretty micro level. It's like, I think this package should be present because I put it there, so let me check if that package is present. It isn't meta level, like, there's at least three of these online and they're all talking to each other. It's, it's kind of, it's very one host, uh, you know, package and slash a file and slash etc and so on. And you're using Ansible as well? We use it for multi We use it to, for, to manage things that we don't deploy in the Kubernetes, but we use it to manage uh, our Kubernetes host uh, because we run some custom bare metal. The nice thing about Ansible is it does work on everything, right? It works on bare metal, on bare metal. As long as you can SSH to a host automatically, it, it does what a unique system in would be able to do, which is to go grope around in files and stuff, right? The, in the past year, that also has significantly improved their Yeah. So we we'll start managing our uh, the switches and so on. Yeah. That's actually one of the things that I'm probably I'm hoping never to have to look at, which is the network config. But one of the areas that we may run into for for our thing is we want globally available IPs, and there's you don't configure the BGP rules, but you're configuring something that's not too far removed from that, and 
you know, the cloud load balancers. And that's the other reason you look at Spinnaker, is Spinnaker ostensibly has support for those, and those are outside of Kubernetes, so I can't just use Helm. So I went into this thinking, it's going to be easy. GitLab CI job runs, last line, Helm install X, done, right? The problem is as soon as you have things that Helm can't touch, and Helm only runs once, so Helm is like Ansible. I run it, it puts things in the desired state, and it bugs out. Now, it's desired to say it stores into Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will theoretically make things go back to that desired state, but it doesn't do anything for things that are outside of Kubernetes, like your cloud database, your big table, you know, creating a S3 or GCS uh, blob store, and it doesn't do anything for making sure that your load balance are still there and your DNS name is set up and you know that stuff. So that's one of my challenges. Um, then the other thing that's interesting, so one of the other reasons I like about Spinnaker, so maybe you can comment on how you do this, is it automatically sets up your monitoring and logging for, for you. So if you're running Prometheus, it automatically creates the Prometheus scrapes and the Prometheus alerts. So there's different models, right? The thing I deploy has a Prometheus in it, or there's some external, infinitely reliable one that I want to communicate with. And the nice thing about Spinnaker is, on paper, it goes and sets that up for you. So you know, that's sort of the promise. Um, so the workflow, you know, there's different, this is another one, everyone has a different strategy. So you hear a lot about the word GitOps. It's a company called Weave. Weave is a, a networking layer company that has an overlay network in the cloud. And they have this, they coined this term GitOps. I check it in and it happens effectively. So any, this, this one branch, any merge commit to that branch, it just sort of goes into operation. So if you want to roll it back, then you need to do another commit to that branch. Um, and a related one is you tag it. You know, this branch, it can be, it, it's always up to date, but everything with a tag, that goes into production. So as soon as the act of tagging, it causes it to go there. Um, you know, you hear that one a lot. The other one is you hear a lot is the CI passes, so it happens. That's the, the, the Circle CI, the GitLab CI. You know, the, the master branch, everything that passes on it goes into production, or everything that passes that a tag is set on goes into production. You know, so that makes it happen right away. Um, there's the push and pull. So Spinnaker is kind of funny. So I'm using GitLab. GitLab will do outbound webhooks on events, but Spinnaker can also come back in the API and pull stuff. And it pulls fast, like, holy crap, like, I don't know how often they think I deploy stuff, but it's like 100 times a second, like, get, 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 my log is full of Spinnaker. Um, I don't really see the need that a, a, a CD task is, is like, like 15 minute accuracy is probably okay in my opinion, but I guess if you're doing a thousand deploys an hour, maybe it's important, but, or maybe you're in a hurry to do the rollback, maybe that's what they're doing. Um, and then the other one that's interesting, I don't, does anyone have an opinion on this? So one, one, one approach is every container, that container, when it passes all the tests, it deploys into wherever it's running. And then the other approach is I have a repo with the, the tooling, the, the, you know, the infrastructure's code, and it only pushes there, so I change the tag in what container I'm going to run. So in the first one, imagine I have a wiki, and the wiki has a database, and a back end, and a front end, okay? So it's got three containers. So every time the front end, repo has passed, just deploys that. That would work for something that size, but as soon as you have a lot of interconnection between them, you might have dependency chains you want to hard code in. Seems like you'd use the repo. So what's your strategy? So with Kubernetes, we just bundle the configs and the app code in one repository. We typically will just deploy the container. Um, so in, we'll, we'll typically have two containers of just the back end and the front end, and we'll just deploy both of those. Yeah. Um, but we haven't had any complex applications like where you have many, many dependencies. This is more of like a microservice architecture where you're running hundreds of different services. And they're all very simple, so you don't really run into that problem. Yeah. So one of the ones that I'm facing is we're planning to run Druid. And Druid is a, um, it's a columnar database uh, similar in nature to Google's big table query thing. Um, and it has a lot of roles within it. So, you know, conceptually, you either upgrade big from Druid, or you've got Broker, and Overlord, and Peon, and Middle Manager, and Historical, it's got all these different roles. So I gotta do some thinking about that, because it is, they all interrelate with each other on version number. Um, it's operator support isn't strong yet, so my challenge there is if I tell them all to upgrade, I'm not sure what'll happen, but if I tell just one of them to upgrade, I know I might not like what happens, so. Um, Dan's gonna tell me to use big table and suck it up, but. The cost would be astronomical. How are you deploying Druid? 
gone? Are you containerizing it? And like with yeah, Kubernetes, that's or is that an outside of Kubernetes thing for you? you told me that was no, so idea. we're doing it inside of Kubernetes. Uh, so I submitted the pull request to the Druid uh, project today for the container for it. Uh, and I have uh, three different people who have given me home charts they're using. So there's a guy at a bank in the UK, not the same bank by the way, uh, that they run into production, so he gave me their home chart. Um, there's a guy that's got a pull request to the Kubernetes Helm repo that's got a chart that he's never going to get accepted because <laughs> so much wrong with it. Um, and then there's a third one which somebody, to make matters worse, he posted into that pull request and told the other guy he was an idiot and all wrong and his was better. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to deploy it there. Um, so there's lots of different strategies for Druid. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with Druid, so Druid, it's kind of magic. So on paper, uh, it's completely scale out. You can start and stop things willy-nilly and it just sorts itself out. It's not actually cloud native, so it, it, it's Apache, so it uses Zookeeper. And Zookeeper is like console, which fights heavily with Kubernetes. They each want to own discovery and management and scaling, but there's a way to sort of make one the master of the other. Um, and it has a set of storage so it's got one set of storage that you can nuke willy-nilly and it just sorts itself out. And it's got another called deep store that you can't. Uh, and there's lots of different types of deep store. So you can use S3, you can use Azure Blob Storage, you can use GCS, you can use ClusterFS. So we're planning to use Azure Blob Storage for the, the deep storage, which is not performance critical, and then no local storage for the other. And that allows it to deploy in, in Kubernetes uh, natively. Uh, I've got it all working now and it seems okay. Uh, and but I'm not finished with the stress testing and so on yet. Uh, the reason I want to do it in Kubernetes is a couple, sort of to Dan's point earlier about you're better to be really good at one thing than kind of average at 10. So I'd rather be really good at that one API rather than also having to figure out how to deploy it on the, on the underlying virtual machines. Uh, but secondly, it allows me to auto scale it pretty easily. Um, so if that can allow it to bring its own uh, backends on and off. There's pizza over here too if you want, right? There's, there might be one peanut butter beer left. I don't know. I think Scott was bogarting. Yeah, that's fine. It turns out it might not have been as popular as we thought in the one second we spent at the liquor store. Um, yeah, so Druid is an interesting question. So for me, we went down the path of Elastic for a while, and I, I'm not an Elastic fan at the end of that. So I, I got to say, when you look at Elastic from a million miles away, it solves the world's problems. The closer you get to it, the harder it is to use. Because it goes from, there's no such thing as schema and it's just magic, you throw data into it, to you better define exactly the range on that integer, and I hope it's not over a thousand. Zero to a thousand is one type of integer, and zero to infinity is another, and we got different opinions on Elastic, but um, yeah, it, it didn't work that well for me. It was crashing all the time and stuff, so. Uh, Druid, I think, solves my, my need, because it's a columnar database that compresses high cardinality data really, really well. So yeah, we'll be doing it in Kubernetes. And that's gonna be one of the ones that I'm worried about the continuous deployment for. So we're either gonna be writing an operator for it or collaborating with most other people to write an operator. So on the surface, I don't need an operator. An operator encapsulates all the operational knowledge. So Druid has these like, whatever, nine different roles. Overlord, peon, email manager, historical, broker, uh, zookeeper. And on the surface, as long as there's more than one of any one of them running, all is good and any one of them can be completely deleted at any point in time. In practice, uh, I'm not so sure that's true. When you get to the point where you can push a button and... I got that. Okay. I got that now. Great. I can do Docker Compose up through it if you want. That's easy. Um, and I, I, I did this a test. So uh, the University of Waterloo has an open data set repository in GitHub. It's very exciting. So I went there and they had the latitude and longitude of all the uh, uh, access points on campus. So we're planning to use Superset, which is this really cool uh, dashboarding tool, and it's got great lat long map support. So I'm like, I'm gonna figure out how to import this damn thing in Druid and have a go at it. So I did that, and then it promptly mapped into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, just above Antarctica, because, you know, it's so reason. So anyway, so I got that all working, and then I realized that they last updated this repo in 2006. So anyway, I, it was pretty exciting for me. And then I left it all weekend running a bunch of other jobs. Um, so I was going to do a demo. I may come back to Spinnaker in a second, but maybe a better different conversation because my demo kind of sucks um, because I ran into a snag and then we had a customer meeting. So my big what ifs, these are the things that are keeping me up uh, and I'm curious to see what people have done about them. 
Um, what if you can't back out? So here's a real story that happened to me the other day. So funny, funny thing happened on the way to the cloud. So we run in GKE as our primary massive corporate infrastructure, and we run in AKS as our development slash customer facing uh, infrastructure. Um, and GKE, it does a great job of auto upgrading. You know, because we, we want to eat the dog, but we just let it auto upgrade whenever it wants, willy nilly. And um, many of those have probably occurred without me knowing them. But there are some that I know about, and I know about them for reasons. So one of them happened. And all of a sudden, everything's down. All the nodes are just not working. And uh, so I scoop around a little bit, and there's a thing called a CRD, a custom resource descriptor, and we run a networking technology called Calico, which is basically a layer three over overlay with BGP. And BGP is going to turn to be critical because what the Calico people have done it, it, in Kubernetes, they have this concept called version. So every API is a YAML file, and on line one of it, it says API version X. And usually, they start at like alpha one pre, don't use me, beware of leopard, and then they eventually end up at release someday out here. And somewhere along the way, they get rid of them. But they're not supposed to get rid of ones that people are using because they can go a little backwards, right? So they usually have this strategy that you should be able to losslessly go from n to n plus two and back again. So n minus two to n, n plus two from where you are, losslessly. And that's the litmus test. When you write something that, that creates something in Kubernetes API, you're supposed to be able to take an arbitrary config from a user, upgrade it to the new version, downgrade it back to the same version, and run diff and see no change. The Calico people may not have got this memo, or the Kubernetes people may not have got all of the memo, or GKE. It's unclear. I opened a ticket with GKE, and they immediately closed it saying, thanks for not buying support. Um, and then shortly afterwards, they fixed it, and they referenced my issue in the ticket. So I know they listened after telling me they wouldn't support me without paying. So. Um, what had happened is they just deleted one of the versions of the, the CRD. The old version wasn't there anymore. And what had happened is it had tried to upgrade the node, and it had done this test, so that failed. Then it tried to downgrade the node, and that failed, so then it left my node offline. So first it cordoned one node, and it drained all the load, and then it upgraded it, and it saw that it thought it was online. So then it cordoned the other node, it drained all the load off that, upgraded it, and then it went, oh, that one's not there, oh, that one's not there. Um, this is one of my worries about continuous deployment, is you know, we're going to do our upgrades at the least convenient time possible for us. So you know, you know, two minutes before Kyle takes his wife out for their tech day anniversary, you know, Christmas Eve at you know, you know, 9 p.m., that kind of thing. And what happens is this wasn't that easy to fix. So fortunately, I, I kind of figured this out pretty quickly because I knew what Calico's CRDs were. I could see that one was missing. But I, I think most people wouldn't have been playing with the CNI, the networking layer of Kubernetes, that recently. Most people would have probably been sad. And I think I could easily see that happening with any application that you have. So um, those who are doing CD, how do you test the backwards, the going backwards? Do you test that once and then assume it works and let the CI run forever? Or does every single thing that'll upgrade get a test cluster and install the old and then install the new and then go back halfway through? Like, what do you do? That's a difficult question. <laughs> Short answer. It works. Sure, I'm here to go. <laughs> well, that Spinnaker would be good for that because of how it versions a lot of the artifacts. It would give you a lot of that history, but yeah, no, it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's a great point. Yeah. So, some people say you only go forward. So if you go forwards and it doesn't work, you create a patch and go more forwards and just keep, you never go back. The ratchet. Yeah. Um, and if, if you built a system that makes it easy to upgrade or deploy, then you it should be easy to just keep moving forward. So this issue is for when you find it only in production. So if you're doing your blue-green testing, I guess you've only got 1% of it online. But when, so the second, you know, I told you guys already about the Linkerd issue, they were stuck because their old one wasn't working and their new one wasn't working. And it was because something had come along and changed this field in Redis and said, oh, we no longer allow bracket bracket, we need this to be null. Something else went wrong and they tried to downgrade and null didn't work on the old one and they, they blew up. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I, I like the idea of only going forward, but I think a lot of people they want to be able to roll back from something they roll. There are some companies uh, they test downstream dependencies like that, like for npm, where they'll actually go into the library and make sure that it's actually working in the ways it's expected. Uh -huh. But obviously, that's very difficult if you're not a huge team, right? So. Yeah. This uh, there was a what was the thing that broke the sem the other day? The Docker registry. Here's another one. Anyone in the room run Docker? 
Has anyone looked inside the sausage factory at the Docker registry? <laughs> that thing, for a tool that nearly every development shop in the world uses today, that is the worst piece of crap. Because they, they weren't running their CI, so the day they released it, they didn't realize that it didn't build on their target platform, which was ARM. So they went into this sort of, oh, I don't know what to do. We tagged it, it's there, but it doesn't build. Because they didn't test it a whole way along. The release cycle, about 18 months apart, the thing leaks memory. The database structure is just a bunch of directories on disk. So anyway, they come out with this new version. And because I, I believe in Semper, believe in it. So I've got my thing set to so 2.star, I'm going to accept, because it's going to be compatible, right? So it moves from 2.6 to 2.7, and it falls over, because there's now a new required entry in the config, which nobody, it wasn't documented. Some guy, two days before release, and sent a pull request on this, which had failed their CI, which they accepted anyway, which had no documentation for. So everybody's like, I don't know, I just pulled this 2.7, it doesn't work at all, it just doesn't even start. Yeah, so maybe they test the Gabber stuff, but I'm sure some of these projects aren't so good at this. Yeah, and it's also bad when they use like the latest Docker image and then that could break something else that yeah. they depend on, so it's, yeah, it can get messy. Yeah. So that's one of my what ifs that's a big problem. Um, what if the new version, like we talked about Mike's bank account. So I've done my blue green testing, I've got a beta user, beta user's online, you know, they do something that is transactional in nature, and then I decide to want to roll that back. Like what, I don't know, I, I don't know if that's a solvable problem. The other one that's a big one is what if the perp's all different? Like, which, who among us hasn't upgraded some software and discovered that with real data, the perp is completely different than what it was before? Like, oh my God, it's 10X, what do we do? Well, we deploy 10x more stuff. We're running out of money. What do we do? Uh, I don't know. Tune? We only go forward. Um, the good thing is, if you've done it right in the cloud, you can deploy more 10x more. But some things don't scale very well. You know, what do we got? We got a 1 plus 1 Postgres. What's it scale by? IOPS. How many are we using? All that we can. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I, I don't think you're going to get much out of my demo with Spinnaker because it, it kind of, uh, the last second kind of broke. But for those who haven't seen Spinnaker as a tool, maybe I can just bring it up. Um, let's see if I can do both of the screens at the same time. a really great dramatic demo and it kind of so I decided to switch over to Chrome which has turned out pretty good except that it's got this real split brain thing because it runs Linux and Chrome OS and Android simultaneously with very light integration between them. when I say very light the clipboard only works between two of those three um, so Spinnaker um, I still think Spinnaker is a pretty good tool uh, one of the things I've learned about cloud is it doesn't scale down well. That's both in terms of people, but also equipment. So for every tool in the cloud, the tooling is usually the hardest part because, like, so Spinnaker was developed by Netflix, I think, and probably Netflix is a, a DevOps team that knows how to make this work in their environment. And then one day somebody said, we should open source this. So they just made a tar out of some guy's home directory and committed it to GitHub and said, there, done. And, um, probably some of the stuff that they needed to make it work didn't come along for the ride. And then the community starts sorting that out and trying to make it, but you end up with this thing that's very complicated. So Spinnaker, so the, the main difference in architecture, the reason I kind of like Spinnaker, the GitLab CI or the Circle CI model, there's no server. So that model, you have a pipeline that you've written, and the pipeline runs and it does all the steps for you. And then it's done, you're in the state you want. Whereas Spinnaker is a server that's continuously doing something for you. And they each have pros and cons. The first one is definitely simpler. You know, you've got your pipeline, it shows you your pass fail, and you've got audit history, and it's tied into your Git and all that other stuff. And the server model, it allows you to do things like alarm management. Let's see if I can, I don't know if we can even get that to go. Maybe that's a little on this. So it also can configure things that are outside the scope of the infrastructure uh, that Kubernetes is capable of doing. And that's where it would start to get difficult for me in GitLab CI, is if I wanted to go and create 
a DNS domain name. I wanted to go and create a certificate in Let's Encrypt. I want to create a cloud load balancer. I want to create Azure Blob Storage. Those are all possible because each of the providers has a scripting command line thing. You do AZ, AZ something or, or uh, G Cloud something. Um, but now you've sort of got this bilingual language there and it, you have to deal with failures. So it's complicated. So Kubernetes, they're built around this model of this is how I want the world to work. In any order I want, I can jam this into its database and it will try everything until everything's working. It's basically a retry mechanism. I've got a set of pods that depend on uh, permanent virtual um, storage and uh, they're just going to keep trying to start until that's available. And then, oh, if one of them already had it mounted, it's probably been killed and it's a single single mount one, it's going to keep retrying. And oh, this one, the, 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 I can't get to the registry right now or the registry hasn't been pushed. So you have this funny scenario, we run our registry in our Kubernetes. So when I upgrade everything, the registry goes away, they kind of they bang away for a while until the registry is going again, or in the case of Semver issue, never. Um, it would be really challenging for me when you have other failure modes or steps that are outside of that. So if I have to go and create a load balancer and then configure HTTP rules on it to do the blue green, which is what Spinnaker can do, I have to wait for all that to be done before I can load the stuff into Kubernetes because some of the config needs to go across to it, like the IP address. Um, Have you looked at Terraform for that? Yeah. Um, <coughs> anyone else use Terraform? Okay. I use it heavily, so. <laughs> so we got a Terraform fan. You can do um, what, what you were just talking about, how you can wait until that IP becomes yeah. available before you, know, you can launch the next thing or whatever. But it's different because this is like if you want to launch a virtual machine or a load balancer, it's different with Kubernetes if you want to launch something within it. Yeah. It's, it's, <coughs> There are some I, think, I think they have a Kubernetes provider, although I don't know how in detail it is. So there are some people that, um, believe it or not, there's 80 companies that may run managed Kubernetes on top of the infrastructure as a service public cloud providers. So Azure, Google, and Amazon each run their own managed Kubernetes, which is free, no additional cost. There are 80 companies that saw a need to replace that thing that's free and charge for it. Um, there are some people that believe in creating their own Kubernetes clusters, and that's part. That's one of the other challenges I have with something like Spinnaker or Terraform. Is theoretically, there's a day where I'm not just deploying into a cluster, but I'm creating a cluster. Um, some people seem to think that nothing in the world is upgradable. It's funny. Along the way, look, when when I started in software, you had to create an install package for your thing, and it had to have an uninstall, and it was once something you tested. I installed it, I uninstalled, there's no files left. I did the, did the job, right? Along the way, developers got lazy and said, you know what, just run make install. And then along the way, they're like, oh, I don't even know how to run make install. I got some script called build.go, and we're gonna bundle this into a container called Docker, and I built it last year, Wednesday, and we're just pushed the Docker up, and we're good to go, that's it, right? Along the way, people got lazy, and they don't even know how to install their own shit. Like, so, that's the challenge, is if you go down the path of having too many things, I'm really worried about it. So you like Terraform, right? Yeah, it's great. Um, I've used it to launch like GKE cluster, stuff like that as well. So why would you use it to launch a GKE cluster rather than gcloud? Because you can track the state of the cluster. So for example, if you have a developer or an operations person that goes in and let's say tweaks a setting, Terraform can actually detect that. So um, you want to make so sure- So it's the reconcile it's, against expected. Yeah, it's lifecycle management is the main benefit. And okay. also, and it uses the state to do that. So if someone opens up the firewall rule, Terraform would notice that. Does it still that. allow GKE to create the nodes? It doesn't create the nodes, right? Um, you can define that, yeah. Okay. So if you want to, uh, let's say you want to have three nodes, like you can tell them to, to launch three nodes. But it doesn't create virtual machines and install. It doesn't run cube admin. You're oh, no, 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 no. It just launches the cluster, that's it. Okay. And a few other settings, like if you want to define uh, the backup windows and stuff like that. Basically, everything that's in the UI on Google Cloud, you can define it. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to bother trying to go through my demo because it actually doesn't work at the end of it. So it's kind of kind of sad. It's turned to be more complicated than I, than I thought. Um, but what I was the reason I liked Spinnaker was some of what you just said, which is the ability to reconcile. It's doing what I think to make sure there isn't a gap between those that a person is introduced. The fact that it's running all the time, I kind of like about it. What is it? Is it the CD tool, or yeah. is it yeah. more like <coughs> so general purpose thing? It's like CD tool, yeah, yeah. specifically yeah. just CD. Yeah, so, so that's a paid model, right? With the Terraform? With the Terraform? Is it? Uh, Terraform? Yeah. No, it's free. Which one is the one? That's the HashiCore. I thought that was. Uh, they have an enterprise version, but that's for like 
It's like Ansible and Ansible Vault. So yeah. you have Terraform yeah, yeah. and Terraform uh, uh, Go Ansible around. Traveler, I think, is the, is the Ansible one. Yeah. It's exactly like that, where you okay. get like a fancy UI and some support yeah. and some other stuff. So, so Terra, in a nutshell, Terraform is very similar to Heat from OpenStack. You define your desired state in terms of a virtual machine mm -hmm. and an image and a network and a subnet and a little bouncer. And it's got a cloud driver that allows it to target Amazon or Google or OpenStack and just makes that happen uh, for you. Um, and it, it, it will sit and wait for something to occur. And if you have software that needs to be installed, it can install software on it for you and you know, those things. So it's, it's meant to automate. Uh, it's not entirely dissimilar to Kubernetes, but it's quite different in terms of the layer that it's at. But you define a declarative version. The nice thing about it is that for, you know, it gets your development team the ability to create an exact environment. They can go build their own thing, even for things that aren't sort of Kubernetes native. We use it to provision test environments, both yeah. in our continuous integration pipeline and okay. at our... It's great for that. At so our, and, you're doing, and you're doing that on your EC2 stuff with Amazon, right? In, uh, yeah, but so do you call our, our developers games? can use Terraform to create okay. our, like, stand yeah. up our product in LXC okay. in their development environment as well. How does that compare to things like cloud formation? Uh, Cloud no, it's not really the same as cloud formation. It's more of a configuration management mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, cloud formation will tell you what, yeah, it's what it tells you the stuff's happened. This is for the other side of it. It's, uh, yeah, it's for it's infrastructure as code. It's, it's yeah. for launching like, virtual machines. And build out. Yeah, so what Pete just said, that's the most common reason for, for Terraform. If somebody's figured out, okay, a small the smallest of these we can test with is X. Here's the definition. Right. At Sandline, what we use Heat for is, is what Terraform is that, but it's sort of cloud. Control it has providers for Google and for AWS yeah, and yeah. for LXC and for virtual you can do like box. DNS changes. And it, gets, it gets pretty good. It can yeah, provision you, know, and, you, you can go create a DNS and you can create a firewall, you can have a rule of the firewall, you can have a subnet, you can you know, do that sort of thing. It is very similar to Heat. Um, so that's kind of all I had then, given that the demo kind of sucked ass. But Spinnaker, the reason I like Spinnaker, it, uh, theoretically, you guys could use Spinnaker. And you could have people come in, and there's like a run button. Uh, I don't even know where I'm at here, but um, you, you could have it so that all your changes that happen in Git on some branch go live. But you could also have your developers have a run button. They can also run a front command line. But for what you're talking about, Terraform is probably the better product. Um, so Spinnaker, the things that Spinnaker will do that are difficult or impossible to do in Terraform going and configuring your live Prometheus and adding the, the scrapes and the monitoring and the alarm management would be a complex one. Um, yeah, yeah, they both are kind of, they're not really competing tools, they're, they right. both solve their own problems. Reconciling against active. So for me, it came down to, do I run Helm from our CI, which I'm very comfortable doing, or, and then Helm would be our manual developer case. And that's currently what we're doing. So I like Helm, Helm has worked really well for me. Um, the downside to Helm, there's a couple downsides to Helm. First is it kind of has infinite privilege, and some people are really worried about that. And there's some work afoot, but Helm, if Helm runs both on your client and in the server side, and it, that, it doesn't allow it to continuously run and reconcile. So you can't really say, Helm, are you still the way I wanted you? Kubernetes can say that, but Kubernetes doesn't know that somebody hasn't patched it and said, hey, add one more pod or do a queue control edit. It doesn't really know you haven't done that. Spinnaker can do that. Spinnaker can create an audit log to say what's been deployed when. Um, it interacts with my artifact repository. The only one we have right now is GitLab and the, and the Docker registry of SendBurping. I don't know if we're going to have another artifact registry. This is a repository. This is something that I'm really struggling with is what to do there. Um, like we store them in GitLab today. That's working well. But I don't really have a retention strategy, so we just delete everything after a while. But someday I'm going to probably not have that luxury. Um, are you talking about common artifacts or uh, just general? So there's several types of artifacts that I care about. So one, we run a static application scanner, which is Claire. So we have the CVE, the, the vulnerabilities in this code that we've built. We run uh, NPM audit and so on in the code. So that creates a report that allows me to know this code, these hashes, with these vulnerabilities went in here. And I kind of want to be able to produce that later if I need to. I have the we have a couple of binaries that are kind of funny. They, like, we've been doing some upstream work on Envoy, which is the Istio load balancer. 
And Envoy has this really weird build strategy where there's other people that use it, but they, they use it from a, a shared spot rather than building it themselves. And so right now we have a GCS share that that gets put into because it's, it's huge. Um, and it's just too big for me to want to push back up the GitLab pipeline thing. We have the Docker containers we build. We store those in the Docker registry. I don't store them back in my artifact store right now. So the artifact store is nice. Like I'll, I, can give, I can show you an example. Um, it won't be too exciting for a lot of you, but... Uh, um, this was supposed to be the demo we would see tonight, but it was not seen. So this is the change that I just made for Druid. Um, so with, with um, GitLab, so we've got, we've got these sort of artifacts, which are like the, the build logs and so on, you know, all that other junk. But theoretically, we could have had other artifacts here. That, well, this one was a bad example, but I'd be able to pull down and I can see a zip file that shows um, the vulnerability scan that went into it, the dynamic scan, the other test reports. Some of them are producing a binary that you want to keep, so the Envoy one is an example. Um, one theory is that it's good enough to have the Docker registry for that. We've been struggling with retention on the Docker registry. Docker registry has no delete mechanism. Believe it or not, until version 2.7, the one that just released badly, anything you thought you did that would delete data wouldn't delete it. So you would, even if you overwrote a tag or deleted the tag, that is just orphan data, and it would just leak all your space away. And your only real strategy was to periodically blow away your registry or write one of the many scripts that people like me have written that pair SHA hashes and rope around in directories and periodically delete all your containers and your coworker yells at you. Only happened once, I will say. Um, and because the CI are rebuilt them, but um, that could be a problem if I had those running in production. If you've got a problem that occurs there, is you bring up a new node and Kubernetes wants to move one of the columns over there and then it goes to a poll and that doesn't exist anymore and it goes, it goes nuts. Um, so theoretically, you should never delete anything, but of course, people have to take your stores in their world. What do you use for artifacts? Probably some of you use Atlassian, some of you probably use JFrog. Some of you probably S3. don't know. We use S3. Just S3, but nothing else on top of it? So what what what's the permissions? Uh, so we, for, uh, for Docker artifacts, we use uh, Google uh, Data Registry. OK. Uh, so GCR. GCR, yeah. Uh, for our home charts, we use Charts, yeah. Uh, for other artifacts, like test results, uh, data scan results, et cetera, uh, we basically have an internal web server. So one of my issues is like there's like, we have a lot of builds occurring all the time across the 20 odd repos that we have. And most of them are only really interesting for a little bit of time. And they're producing a lot of data that I don't really care to keep. And I don't really have a strategy for that yet that I can really come up with. Um, so they're all stored in, in here, and they, they show up as these zips, and then every four weeks, it just all the old ones fall at the end. So we kind of like the tag ones of the master branch, maybe not to do that. Um, using Docker Hub. <laughs> Yeah, but there's a cost. Well, it's free. Yeah, it's great. I've, I've been using it for like a few months now. And, and I, I think it would have been a good backup strategy. Just take my desktop, make it into zip files, What's that? do a Docker, just copy in, just push, push it there. Push it I don't know. I'm surprised it still works. Like, I, I don't yeah. understand. Like, <laughs> they just did a big refactor on it the other day, and I think a lot of those features are going to go away. Maybe. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, we push a lot of stuff. Okay. If, if you have a single, a single image, would you just keep updating? Yep. Yeah. As soon as you go beyond one image, then you have to stay in for it. No, I don't it. Well, it's, well, I'm sorry, it's open source, so it's open. So as long as it's open and it's public, you can put all the stuff you want. There's no free lunch anywhere. Any I tags. <laughs> tags. I have multiple tags, like like eight or nine different repos. You keep all of the like, tags? Oh, yeah. They're there. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. There, there's version tags and there's daily tags. So we were going through about 20 gigabytes a month of storage, and it, was, it really wasn't that interesting. So then, I, then I, I thought I was clever. I invented a script that would fix that, and it would go and delete all the tags of the ones that weren't interesting. But then its garbage collector didn't delete any data. And then I looked into it, and there's like 100 issues open. Docker registry doesn't delete. Closed. Operates as expected. Docker registry doesn't leave. It's because you don't understand. It's very hard. Close as expected. <laughs> like clearly the users want to delete, right? Like 
We're inventing a file system. What does it have to do? Create, read, update. Okay, we're done. Let's go for lunch. Like what? <laughs> Love Hotel California. Um, yeah. So this is what GitHub gives you. It also gives you a set of uh, operations you can do. So the CD can automatically deploy, and you can have a set of metrics and environments. The environments keep track of like dev and fraud, that sort of thing. It can keep track of your Kubernetes secrets for you, so it can deploy without the uh, underlying containers being able to get to it. It's hooked into its uh, JWT um, model for permissions, and it also does the registry management for us. Now, we run the registry beside it, but it handles the permissions that you can delete from here. So now this delete works. So if I was to delete this, it would actually delete it, uh, which is that was kind of thing. So this is my battle, is I either use those features in GitLab, which I quite like and works well, or I use Spinnaker because it has this real-time ability and the integration with Prometheus and so on. Or I get stuck in the middle and I use something like Helm running for GitLab CI or Terraform running for GitLab CI. We haven't quite sorted all that out yet, but the plan is for us to sort that out in the next months. All right, that's all I had on the presentation. There's more pizza here. Let's continue the chat and I'm going to close the projector.